and welcome to the John Locke Foundation Tomato Sandwich Day. Um, this has gotten to be kind of a tradition around here, and usually when we do Tomato Sandwich Day, we also talk about what's going on at the General Assembly. Um, and the reason for that is, um, you know, it, it sends a message. This started, this Tomato Sandwich Day at the General Assembly is, is really quite a tradition. And it started years ago with representatives from Alamance County. Now, some of you all may know, it's the Burlington area, some of you all may know that German Johnson tomatoes originated in Alamance County. There was a German fellow whose last name was Johnson who planted tomato seeds in Alamance County, hence the German Johnson tomatoes. So years ago, members, the legislative delegation from Alamance County to kind of show off their products of Alamance County started Tomato Sandwich Day at the General Assembly. Well, if you're familiar with our work at the John Locke Foundation, you know that we are always ready, able, and willing to steal any good ideas, no matter where they are. So it has now become a tradition at the John Locke Foundation as well. And I have to tell you, so I was on my way in this morning, and thank you all for being here. I mean, Donna was keeping me posted over the weekend as RSVPs came in, and, um, you know, I was feeling quite, you know, kind of puffed up about this. You know, this is a big crowd for us today. Um, and so on my way in this morning, I called my mother, who I call every morning. Some of you all may know I wrote a column about her over the holidays. It's in the December issue of Carolina Journal. And so I was telling my mother I was coming in doing this presentation. I said, you know, it seems there's going to be a big crowd there today. I'm really, you know, very flattered about it. And she said, well, you know, honey, people just love tomato sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for the five of you who are here to hear my talk, thank you. For the rest of you, please help yourself to another tomato sandwich. Um, so let's get started here. Uh, this story today that I'm going to tell you about the General Assembly, where we've been, where we have just come from, and where we're going to be going, is really a story about the General Assembly and the John Locke Foundation. Many of the reforms, many of the ideas that we have seen implemented in North Carolina are because of the work at the John Locke Foundation. And it seems like an appropriate time, if I could ask all of my colleagues at the John Locke Foundation just to stand up, just you all know Donna because you see her every month. Monday. But the work that we do, come on, y'all, they're, they're very shy. <laughs> but, but the work that we do, led by our president and CEO, Corey Swanson, really is a team effort. And I have the best job in this building because I get to take all the work that all these very, very smart people do. I get to put it together and go down to the General Assembly and speak to groups like you and talk about the great work that we do. And when I say we, I mean all of my colleagues. So this really is a story of the John Locke Foundation, our work, our influence, and the General Assembly. So we've had to, to talk about what happened at the General Assembly during the short session and the significance of it. Really have to go back to 2011 and the transformational changes that have occurred since then. Because the one message that we had for the General Assembly going into the short session was just keep doing what you're doing. We've got the ball rolling, things are going in the right direction, just keep doing what you're doing. And those transformational changes include restraining spending, building up savings, paying off debt. This is what we call conservative fiscal management. In 2010, when Republicans were elected to take over the General Assembly, um, we had huge shortfalls in our state budget. Spending was out of control. In many cases, the spending had increased year over year by 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 percent. Uh, we've also seen taxes cut. We have seen our personal income tax go from 7.75 percent. Today is 5.25 percent. Corporate tax has gone from 6.9 percent to 2.5 percent will soon be implemented. And our sales tax has been expanded. The base continues to go and those rates go down. At the same time, that standard deduction, that zero tax balance that we hear about has gone from $6,000 for a family filing jointly to over $20,000 for that zero tax bracket. So when you hear people say these tax cuts are only for the wealthy, it just doesn't, the math doesn't work out. These are tax cuts that all North Carolinians have benefited from. 
removing regulations is something else that we've done. There was implemented a sunset and a periodic review process that was put into place where these rules, many of them in place for 50 years, nobody had ever looked at them. Nobody had ever asked what is the cost associated with those rules. Almost half of the rules have been reviewed at this point. 12% um, have been removed entirely. It's been determined we don't need them anymore. And then another 26% of those rules have been determined that we're going to look at them, we're going to readopt them, we're going to see where they need to be changed. If you think about it this way, every rule, every regulation has a cost associated with it. So when you begin to roll back those regulations, it frees that money up. It gets the economy moving. And in addition to that, we've been making wise investments in North Carolina since 2011. We've been focusing education spending. Education spending is 57% of our state budget. So whether you have children in the public school system, if you're a taxpayer in North Carolina, you need to care about education. And we do here at the Locke Foundation, the General Assembly has recommitted that education to that money and the resources being put in the classroom with the teachers, not building a bureaucracy in a big office building with lots of conference rooms right down the street in Raleigh, North Carolina. We've also really made investments in infrastructure, in roads and transportation. If you think about this, if we're going to attract businesses to come to North Carolina, if we want people to make stuff in North Carolina, if we want people to work here, they've got to be able to get to work. We've got to be able to get those goods and services out in the community in across North Carolina and outside of North Carolina. Now, it used to be that a lot of the spending decisions for transportation, for roads, bridges, those kind of things, was made from political decisions. Um, powerful lawmakers had slush funds. We've reported on this at the John Locke Foundation, where they could dip into that money and exchange an overpass or exchange an intersection or exchange a bridge for a vote, whether that bridge or, or was really needed. What we have now is a strategic investment, a strategic transportation investment plan plan that makes those infrastructure decisions based on engineering data. Where are the, where, first of all, where are there unsafe situations in North Carolina? We've got school buses on the road every single day. Are school buses, are those roads safe enough for our children to be on the school buses? Where are the economic needs? Where are the congestion needs? Where do those dollars need to be spent the best? And rather than looking at infrastructure decisions based on two-year cycles of legislative elections, we now have a 30-year plan so that we know where that money is going to be spent. And again, it's based on data and engineering. Now, all of these things together, um, put, have, we have seen tremendous economic growth in North Carolina. As a fiscal conservative and as a, a part of the John Locke Foundation, we think these are good ideas because they're good fiscally conservative ideas. But we don't believe in this just because we want to win. These are ideas that work. Big ideas mean big results. What we've seen since 2011, we know this works because the economic results, the research tells us that they do. GDP has grown. Jobs, we have had over 500,000 net new jobs have been created in North Carolina since 2011. Now, the significant thing about those jobs, too, is most of these are private sector jobs. These are not government jobs that we're paying more taxes to create bigger government. There have been fewer government jobs created, more private sector net new jobs have been created. Unemployment, the U6 rate, which is the broadest measure of unemployment, has gone from 20% in 2010 to 7.7% just in the last, down to 7.7% in the last year. The fifth biggest drop in the United <coughs> States. Personal income has grown by 3.7% just in the last year. Again, all of these are markers that have set North Carolina as a model across the country. Even more results We've um, in rankings, and there have been lots and lots of these rankings. I just chose um, three of them that I thought were particularly significant. The Tax Foundation, State Business, Tax Climate, we've gone from 44th in 2011 to 11th today. It was the biggest jump the Tax Foundation has ever seen in their rankings. 
uh, the Fraser Institute of Economic Freedom, which measures all kinds of things, but this is where you have an economy that's growing, that people are free to make decisions, and how quickly your economy is growing because of that, the environment that you set. We've gone from 24th to 18th, the Cato Institute of Freedom in 50 states, we've gone from 26th to 19th. Now what this says is, North Carolina is clearly on the right path, we've made these big jumps, these are national rankings that we've done, there's also room for improvement. Uh, We've also seen the fourth straight consecutive revenue surplus. When Republicans took over the General Assembly in 2011, there was almost a billion dollar shortfall. Today, we have a revenue surplus as we have the last three years as well. A uh, $2.8 billion unemployment debt has been completely repaid to the federal <coughs> government, and 99% of taxpayers are paying less than they did before these changes were made. So the short session started off with a bang. One of the things that we learned on the first day of the General Assembly, we had thousands of teachers who came to Raleigh to protest. Now I'm not sure exactly what they were protesting. Again, already in the budget was their fifth consecutive pay increase, additional funding for all kinds of things in education. Again, 57% of our state budget goes for education. Um, I'm quite active on Twitter, so I'll put my Twitter plug in today. Um, it's at Becky Gray, and I tweet a lot particularly during the session, um, you know, during committee meetings, during the debate on the floor. I try to bring a perspective that you don't get by just reading a newspaper, that it's almost minute to minute, side conversations that are going on and that kind of thing. So what we learned, we got a hold of an email from the North Carolina Association of Educators prior to this, pro this big protest. And we learned something really interesting. The NCAE is a union. Now, we had been saying for years they operated like a union. They always said, no, we're not a union. This is from their email where it says, this isn't union-like activity. It is union activity. If May 16th is going to matter, we have to build our union. Our union is what we make it. So, um, you know, that was the first thing we learned during the short session is that what we had known for all these years is the teacher union really is a teacher union. So some highlights of the short session. We had a $23.9 billion budget. That is a 3.8% increase over last year. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that budgets prior to 2011, the increase was, was often in double digits. One of the things that I think is really significant of the changes that we've seen is every single budget since 2011 has been at or below the growth of inflation plus population. Every single one of them. So this is restraining the growth of government. So you've had fewer taxes where you get that um, that relief from the tax end, but you also, you can't have, you know, there's two sides to it, taxes and the spending. And if you're going to reduce the taxes, you've got to reduce the spending. And so they have done that every year. This year was no exception. 3.8% growth, which is again the rate of inflation plus population. Uh, tax cuts went down again this year. Uh, savings are now, North Carolina savings accounts, which had been completely depleted by 2010, are now built up, there's over $2 billion set aside in savings account. It is the largest amount set aside in North Carolina's history. And the reason why that is important, just like it is in your, your family budget or your small business budget, when an emergency comes up, when there's something that you need that's unexpected, you've got to have a little bit of a cushion. Now, when we were going into this in 2010, 2011, there was no money in the rainy day fund, the emergency funds. So I don't think a lot of people realize how very, very lucky we were in North Carolina that we were not hit by a major hurricane during those years or, God forbid, two hurricanes back to back um, because we had no money set aside at all for that. Another reason why savings is so important is North Carolina has a lot of assets. We own a lot of buildings. We own the North Carolina Art Museum. If any of you all have been out there and realized what a tremendous asset that is for North Carolina. We also have government buildings across the state that we have our state employees are working in. We need those buildings to be safe. We also need to make sure that those assets are protected as an investment for us as taxpayers. So we need money set
set aside for those things that, you know, aren't particularly sexy. You know, this isn't a ribbon cutting event, but these buildings need no, new roofs. They need the electrical systems updated. They need bathrooms updated. They need to be painted. They need it to be maintained. So we need the money for that. And then finally, probably the most important reason for this savings is that um, not if, but when the um, state's economy and the nation's economy takes another downturn and we know that it's coming we're really way overdue for it and in many cases these will be things that are way beyond the control of North Carolina legislators but if we're going to have an economic downturn we need to have some money set aside so that the first thing we don't have to do is to raise taxes on businesses that may be struggling on families that are perhaps going through a rough time so we've got to have that money set aside so again two billion dollars in savings is where we are now the largest it's ever been in the history of North Carolina Education funding is something else that they paid attention to during this elect this short session. Uh, you know, my friends on the left keep telling me that um, education is underfunded. Well, seven hundred million dollars more was added to the education budget this year. I've also heard from my friends on the left there aren't any textbooks available in classrooms. Eleven million dollars in this state budget was put aside for textbooks. Um, raises for teachers for principals, for um, state highway patrol, correctional officers, most state employees, uh, there is a $15 an hour minimum wage now for North Carolina state employees. Teachers got their fifth consecutive pay increase. State employees got their fourth consecutive pay increase. Um, you know, these are things that the General Assembly paid attention to. There's also a real focus on safety. You know, we've seen nationally the concern about school safety. They put $35 million into school safety and really started looking at some practical applications of going in and looking at individual schools. What can be done? Where the doors need to be locked? Where do they need to be open? How do we protect our schools? And prison safety as well. You know, we've had some crisis here in North Carolina in the prisons. $15 million set aside for that with every debate, every comment, every vote that I was aware of on the safety issues. This is a beginning. They, are, they intend to continue to move this. This is not an end. Um, we also had the Regulatory Reform Act of 2018. When the Republicans took over the General Assembly in 2011, Senator Phil Berger, the President of the Senate, said he introduced the first Regulatory Reform Act of 2011. And he said then, we are going to have a Regulatory Reform Act every year until we get government off the backs of businesses and individuals. And we have had one every single year. Um, and then there were some big ideas that came through. Um, I think you've got a piece in your materials. Uh, this was so such a simple idea. This was something that we came up with at the John Lott Foundation. As we looked at businesses as occupational licenses, as entrepreneurs and opportunities for entrepreneurs, one thing that we really found kind of consistently was in many cases there were crimes attached to some of those things that an entrepreneur might do with an occupational license. If you practice a particular profession without a license or within the per without with without the parameters of that license you can be convicted of a crime we got really concerned about that we started looking at it and realized that North Carolina's criminal code is a mess in addition to all the crimes that are outlined in the general statute is it chapter 14 Gene, where the criminal code is there's also crimes that are all over the North Carolina statute. Uh, we called on Dr. Jessica Smith, who literally wrote the book on crime in North Carolina. She wrote the big textbook that's used in all of the law schools on crime. Even she was you know, flabbergasted by all of this. In addition to that, there are all kinds of crimes that are outlined through state agencies with the rulemaking that they do, uh, boards and commissions. There are also all kinds of crimes and ordinances with local ordinances, with um, county commission or county government, all the way through. There are all of these crimes that are done, and nobody knows where they are. Many of them are just silly. Like in Ahoski, you can't let your chickens run loose. In some parts of North Carolina, if you let a dog in heat out, you can be convicted of a crime. It goes on and on. There's also all kinds of crime that have already been declared declared unconstitutional, but they're gumming up the system. So what, what happened during this short session, thanks to some great leadership, Representative Horn, um, 
Representative Dennis Rydell, who actually is from Alamance County, so you know a good way to pay tribute to him too. Um, but what this does is it just sets aside a requirement that state agencies, um, the administrative office of the courts, all of the local governments have to report to the General Assembly what all their crimes are. That's all this does. It just begins to index those crimes. We don't know what they all are. Once we get the list together, then we can start to go through them and really make some decisions about what we need, what we don't need, what's duplicative, and begin to clean up the criminal code so that regular people can understand when they are a criminal and when they're not. So this was a, this was a very simple idea, it, but it was a big idea and one that we believe is going to have really long-lasting reforms moving forward. So there were some low lights. There were some bumps, there were some bullets dodged, and some unintended consequences, we believe. A couple of those, the Build North Carolina bond that went through, I think it passed unanimously in both chambers. Uh, we were opposed to it at the Lott Foundation, and I'll tell you why. Because it doesn't require a vote of the people. And we believe that any kind of debt needs to be approved by those who will be paying that debt off. Um, and so we, we now, this past, we have a uh, North Carolina bond for transportation. Um, it's a 10-year, $3 billion bond for road construction. The other thing we were concerned about is in the legislation itself, it doesn't designate which projects will be funded with that $3 billion. And we had concerns about working around that state, the strategic transportation investment plan that I mentioned to you. Uh, we also had incentives. We had more incentives. And if you're familiar with our work at the John Locke Foundation, we think corporate welfare is a big waste of money. We think that the better way to do that is not to give anybody special treatment and to lower the rates for everyone. We believe that that's the greatest and most effective economic incentive that you can have. Uh, my colleague Roy Cordata has written some great work on the difference between economic development and economic growth. And I would encourage you to look at that. It re really sets it out um, very well. But what we had, you know, we had additional expansion. We've got this huge project, this huge um, incentive package for the big apples, the big Amazons, um, you know, 30-year property tax abatement for Amazon in Wake County. Um, you know, when they're not paying property tax, you know who's going to make that up? The rest of us. Um, we also had a special tax treatment for the Panthers football team in Charlotte. Um, you know, we think the Panthers should pay their fair share of taxes like everybody else does. Um, we also had a continuation of the film credits, which my colleague John Sanders has written extensively about that. It goes on and on. I, my column in this month's Carolina Journal is actually about that. So I would encourage you to look there because there were additional carve-outs and special treatments that were proposed this session. Uh, the school psychology, psychologist reciprocity bill was just, that's just one of those interesting stories about how things happen at the General Assembly. Now this was something that we thought was a great idea. This came about in the discussion with school safety. And one of the study committees that had looked at ways to improve school safety had suggested one of the things might be is to increase the number of school psychologists, school nurses, school counselors, that are in the schools. So one way to do that, if you have, you know, again, supply and demand of a particular need, a particular um, product, if we need school psychologists, um, why not allow reciprocity from other states? Um, something else that we have in North Carolina that is a real problem, I'll talk about in just a couple minutes, but is occupational licensing. And so the school psychologist is a really good example of that. To become a school psychologist in North Carolina, you have to go through all this training, you have to pay all these fees, you have to do all these apprenticeships before you can be licensed in North Carolina, even if you are a licensed school psychologist in another state. So what this bill would have done, it would have um, given reciprocity for a school psychologist who passed the National School Psychology Association test. 
So if you pass that test, that's good enough for us in North Carolina to become a school psychologist. We'll get more people that are already here. Think military spouses, people that are moving to North Carolina. You know, there, there's, a, there's a, pa, a pool of those people here. We just need to make it easier to work in North Carolina. Now, as that bill got started, it was in um, House Bill 933. It was put in. Um, Representative Craig Horn, who's here with us today, was a big advocate for that. Now, our only argument with that bill was, if we're going to do it for school psychologists, why don't we do it for school nurses? Why don't we do it for school counselors? Why don't we do it for teachers? Why don't we do it for everybody? Why don't we do it for barbers and locksmiths and nurses and everybody else? But we'll, you know, we have school psychologists, so we'll stick with that. So this was House Bill 933. It went over to the, it passed the House, I think unanimously, didn't it, Craig? Um, went over to the Senate. The Senate loaded the bill up with some other things. It came back to the House, and the House did not concur with those changes. Now, this was happening at the very end of the short session. So we're running out of, we're running out of time to do this. So Representative Horn um, had that provision put into another bill a Senate bill that was in the House, he had that provision put into it. And keep in mind, this was not a controversial provision. I didn't talk to anybody who said that's not a good idea. Um, so w Representative Horn had it put into a Senate bill. The House changed it. It went back over to the Senate. The Senate put that bill in Senate rules, and it never went anywhere. There were also opportunities to put that bill, there was a psychology compact bill, House Bill 1046, that that provision would have been germane to go into that bill. That bill sat in House Appropriations. There was another bill, House Bill 1074, that had to do with psychologist compensation. Again, germane topics that could have gone in that bill. That bill was sent in committee and never went anywhere. So the end of the story was that bill never passed this session, but just kind of a quick story with it too. This is, um, this is what happens at the General Assembly a lot, is you will have a provision that's in a bill. That provision gets pulled out. It gets put somewhere else. It may go. It may not go. It may get pulled out and put somewhere else. So when people were calling me, and this is at the end of the session when there are probably 200 bills that are going through all of this churn and all of this stuff. So it's one we were trying to keep up with because we felt like it was a really good idea in trying to get that through. And of course, this is at 10 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock at night in committee meetings that are held in rooms where there's no audio, where there may not be a seat in the room. So all of this churn and all of these things going on. So even really good ideas sometimes just because of all the traffic that is on the General Assembly road, if you will, in the last hours of the session don't go anywhere. Um, the Digital Communications and Elections Bill was one that was brought up in the last week of session. This had to do with regulating social media for elections. So this was another one that was kind of brought up out of nowhere, um, again, the last week of session. Um, we had some real concerns about it because of it begins to regulate the Internet. And how do you do that? Now, the argument from the other side was that you regulate it just like you do radio ads or television ads. But social media is very different than that. And then how do you find those thresholds if you're a candidate or if you're a person that's active on social media that post election type things, post political things? Um, you know, what is the threshold? If it's 10,000, what does that mean? If you post something on Facebook and your 1,000 viewers <coughs> repost it that many times, what are the reporting requirements? And what is the penalty if you don't do it? Again, getting back to this over-criminalization issue. So that was one that we were very, very concerned about, just beginning to regulate social media. That did not pass, thank goodness. That was one of those, that, that was one of the bullets that were dodged. And then an unintended consequence. This is the second year that the General Assembly has um, put bills together that have to do with the opioid crisis. This is a very serious issue across the country. It's particularly a serious issue here in North Carolina. It's one that all of us should be taking very seriously. But at the same time, it's also important to 
keep in mind and to sort of have that freedom filter on, if you will. And this was one that we had concerns about access to patient prescription records because this would pretty much open it up that anybody could access the patient prescription records. Uh, we, had, we just had issues and concerns about that. Representative Robert Reeves brought up some really good questions. He had an amendment to the bill that would just require that a judge sign off on it before you had access to a patient's, before someone had access to your patient prescription records. Again, this was done in the very last hours of the session. The bill passed. It does have that, pres that prescription um, that sort of open prescription provision in there. It's, that to me was an unintended consequence, something that we will be watching and that perhaps during the long session is something that we might want to go back and revisit and tighten that up. You know, that's one of those bills that I think what they're going to do, it'll, it'll begin to be implemented. We'll see if there are problems with it. And I know Representative Horn and the John Lott Foundation will be watching that. You know, our thing is we want... We want the, the, um, we want the appropriate programs in place. We want the help there. We want the funding there. But we also want to make sure that there are not unintended consequences that threaten um, someone's personal freedom and privacy. So um, I just had to throw this one in. I'm um, talking about the end of the session and kind of how crazy things were. This was the last really rough week of the General Assembly. This had been, they had had session till 10, 11, 12 o'clock every night that week. This was the last day late in the afternoon before Father's Day. And I was up in the gallery and I was watching all of this hubbub on the floor. And you had the speaker and the chairman of different committees who were over in this corner trying to figure stuff out. You had bills coming out of nowhere that nobody had ever seen before. There was just all this confusion and all this trying to do stuff. And I just, you know, kind of had to show. And I was looking around at, um, looking around at some of the female members of the General Assembly who were very calm. They were seated in their seats. They were doing their work. They were on their computer. <laughs> Representative Horn is laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I tweeted this. And um, with all due respect, if women were running the NCGA, we'd be at home on the porch with a glass of wine, Father's Day gifts bought and wrapped. Um, this tweet has been, this is my most popular tweet by like 300%. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, so that's kind of what they did in the short session. We got through it. Um, it was very quick. It was not as long as many of them. This was one of the shortest sessions. I cannot remember when we had a budget passed and in place well before the end of the fiscal year. So there was a lot of really efficiency. There were a lot of good things about it. On, um, but they didn't adjourn sine die. They are coming back on November 27th. They've already set that up. Now here's the thing that's really scary for us and we're already gearing up for. Anything can be considered during that November 27th session, anything. So we may do the school psychology reciprocity bill again. We don't know, but they are coming back on November 27th. So a couple things kind of moving forward with this. Uh, we have a clear choice for voters in November. That's what the short session has left us with. As I think about it and kind of where we are, we have a clear choice for voters. Uh, Governor Cooper proposed a budget right before the General Assembly had their budget out. Governor Cooper's budget rolled back the tax cuts. Now, I call that a tax increase. Um, his budget would create a $500 million deficit, a hole going forward. The Republican budgets have been, again, within the growth rate of inflation plus population. They have cut taxes. They have led to economic growth. They have created jobs. Um, they have paid off debt, and they've put money into savings. So there's a real difference there of what, you know, it's clear as a bell what you're getting with the two different approaches to the state budget. Um, on health care, this was something else that happened at the General Assembly. Two bills that we have. One was sponsored by Democrats that called for universal health care in North Carolina. The other one, House Bill 933, called for more flexibility with health insurance plans so that you could choose the plan that best suits you and your family. 
So on the one hand, you have complete government control. On the other hand, you have freedom and choice and opportunity. Again, a clear choice of what you might want. And then the third choice, I am hearing lots of my friends on the left already in the Locke Foundation, Brenda knows this, uh, we have a very aggressive candidate education project. So we are working with mostly legislative candidates, libertarians, um, Republicans, Democrats from across the state. I am hearing my friends on the left as we go into this election cycle saying what we need to do is we need to expand Medicaid and we are underfunding education. On the other hand, you have people that are talking about tax cuts, jobs, and growing an economy. So again, the choice is very clear in November. So when they come back in November, or when they come back in January, these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. I mean, I'm just giving you a heads up. These are the things that you can expect to see in our newsletters, our research newsletters, our Carolina Journal reporting. Um, we talked about keeping the growth of government at the inflation plus population. Joe Coletti, who is our budget expert, has warned that's really not enough. We can't continue to do that, particularly if we're going to prepare for a downturn in the economy. That growth needs to look more like 2.5% rather than a 3.5, 3.7, 3.8%. 3 uh, something else that came up during this session that we know we're going to see again are some donor privacy, First Amendment, protecting free speech issues. Uh, we're going to be seeing that again. The Lott Foundation, we already have plans. We're going to get out in front of that argument. So you'll be seeing some ideas associated with that. Um, an education funding formula. My colleague Terry Stoops has written about how important it is that we take that 57 percent of our budget that goes to education and that we make sure that that funding formula, how that money gets from the building on Jones Street into the classroom and that it's funded properly. We have one of those convoluted funding formulas. So you'll be seeing a lot of that. Um, occupational licensing, the right to earn a living. Here's what we think at the John Locke Foundation. Let people work. Get out of the way and let people work. So we're going to be hearing a lot, you'll be hearing a lot from us on that. Um, ABC reforms. Um, my colleague John Trump um, has written a book about some of the distilleries in North Carolina, the entrepreneurs, great stories of entrepreneurship. Um, at the same time, we have really restrictive ABC laws. We think the ABC system ought to be privatized. Um, you know, so that's something, and there's a real interest at the General Assembly in really looking at that. Um, further tax reform, and then something that just is going to continue to be a real issue in North Carolina is the urban-rural divide. You know, we hear so much about Republicans and Democrats and how they're fighting and how their interests are so different. You know, another area where there's really different interest is the urban areas and the rural areas. North Carolina is a very diverse state, and the the challenges and the concerns are very different in those two areas. So that's something we're going to be working on and um, talking a lot more about. So a couple final thoughts and then I've got one story for you. Um, Governor Cooper has issued 23 vetoes during his first session with the General Assembly. So most vetoes ever issued by a governor during a short session. He is the veto king so far. Uh, we will have six amendments to our Constitution on the ballot in November. I've listed them here for you. Um, you'll be hearing more about that. Um, there will be a lot of efforts. There'll be, I think, some referendum committees and all that will be talking about these different things and the, the issues that they, they are important. You have a copy of your North Carolina State Constitution with you. Um, so it's a big deal to amend the Constitution and something we should take seriously. Um, and then the struggle over the structure and control of government is something else that we really have seen a lot, something I've been thinking a lot about. We've seen lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Before Governor Cooper even took office, he was suing the General Assembly over that separation of powers. There was actually lawsuits between Governor McCrory and the General Assembly. You know, in North Carolina, as in many southern states, we have three separate branches of government, but they are not equal. The governorship, and this isn't the governor, this is the governorship in North Carolina is very weak. And so there's a real push and pull there of where that is. The General Assembly has really um, asserted themselves and the governor has struck right back on that. So we've seen this real struggle between who controls um, North Carolina's General Assembly. 
So I really was thinking about that, and particularly in some of these bills that we're going through at the very end of the session, some of them that have to do with elections, with the filling of judicial vacancies, of early voting, of who makes appointments in North Carolina, who, what does the North Carolina State Board of Elections look like? I was really thinking about that. And so I tweeted this, um, you know, just because Republicans would be wise when considering changes to the election system to ask what if Democrats had full control of the General Assembly and Republicans held the governor's office? Would it still be a good idea? So I tweeted this. I tend to hate Twitter, but I seem to get attracted there. Um, and I, I, there was a tweet yesterday from Becky Gray with the John Locke Foundation, which I, I thought uh, got well, it got me thinking. And basically she observed that Republicans would be wise when considering changes to the election system to ask what if Democrats had full control of the General Assembly and Republicans held the governor's office. Would it still be a good idea? That's Representative um, McGrady from the western part of the state. That was on the, flat, the House floor, the remarks that he made. So I tweeted back to him that ideas are what matter. Thank you for the mention on the floor, Chuck McGrady. Good ideas will sustain close scrutiny, tough questions, turnaround, and fair play. And he responded this. You really make me think. Because that's what we do at the John Locke Foundation. 